The topic of this video is endurance training for the sport of wrestling, and it is my hope that by the end of this video the most commonly asked questions will be answered. Such as which training methods to choose, whether you should do high intensity intervals or steady state cardio, whether you should choose assault bikes or circuit training, the most common concerns. And to start things off, we need to define what endurance actually is. It might seem like a no-brainer, but it's actually not. For most people, the first thing that pops up is probably cardio, which is an abbreviation of cardiovascular. And this in itself describes aerobic metabolism. But we have many other energy systems in the body, notably the ATP-PCR system and the glycolytic anaerobic system. And both of those are anaerobic systems, and they are also of high importance for enduring wrestling scenarios, if not even more important, which we will go into later. Simply put, as you can see in the picture right here, each one of those energy systems have strengths and weaknesses. The main things that differ are the power outputs of them and how long they last. And in a dynamic wrestling match you will come across various scenarios that accounts for each of their utilization. So knowing that a standard wrestling match, depending on whether you do collegiate or international style wrestling, is between 2 to 3 minutes of activity with 30 seconds to 1 minute of rest between periods, does this make wrestling an aerobic sport or an anaerobic sport? And the simple answer to that is both, but once again arguably with a slight edge towards anaerobic factors. And that is for the simple fact that wrestling is of highly volatile and unpredictable nature. You never really know what's gonna happen. You're gonna have low effort scenarios, high effort scenarios, medium effort scenarios, and all of those are gonna stress the different energy systems. And one thing that we can be sure of is that you will have no period to rest completely. There will be constant activity from the first second all the way to the end. In fact, one study that analyzed a bunch of wrestling matches found out that the activity to rest ratio generally lies between 2.4 to 1, meaning for every one second of passive activity, however they determine that, you will have to do 2.4 seconds of high activity. So now that we know the different energy systems and the demands of wrestling, a more accurate definition of endurance in this case would be the ability to not only withstand and bear on fatigue but also delay its onset. So when we define endurance in this manner, as you can see in the picture here, it opens up a whole new world of parameters. It becomes a clockwork. Change one gear and 10 other gears are affected. Now it's not a matter of running for 10 kilometers and you're set. It's not a matter of the secret cardio exercise that you have been missing your whole life. And this is the essence of sports science. This removes all of the guesswork. It shows you all of the affectable cogwheels, so to speak, and it doesn't dumb things down to one secret exercise. But for the topic of this video we will discuss aerobic and anaerobic endurance. For all of the other components I have made tons of videos already. You can check them out if you want as well. Simply put, aerobic endurance is relevant for low intensity scenarios and it is long lasting but lacks power. Think of just simple footwork or simple hand fighting, something that is relatively tough but manageable. While anaerobic endurance is relevant for high intensity scenarios, it is short lasting but powerful. Think of tough scrambles, chain wrestling, defending a powerful takedown, going for a powerful takedown. And to further complicate this, both systems are of high importance for each other, which we will go into later. So the main thing that characterizes the aerobic system or aerobic endurance is that it is dependent on oxygen, which even the name hints. And a very popular method to measure your aerobic capacity is through what is known as a VO2 max test. And aerobic metabolism overall is important because it helps you to handle the hydrogen accumulation as a result of anaerobic metabolism and the resynthesis of phosphocreatine. In plain English, this means that when you go all out in an activity, for example which commonly occurs in a wrestling match, then the aerobic system helps to clear of those rest products. And this is why it is important for the anaerobic system as well, which we will go into soon. Those are the main adaptations that occur from aerobic training. You can pause this picture and go through them all. Speaking of VO2 max levels, what is the VO2 max levels of wrestlers? Some studies have shown that male wrestlers from various weight classes typically display between 52 to 63 milliliters per kilogram per minute. And this is when it's done via a treadmill. 
When compared to endurance sports, this is not too significant, especially when we talk about cross-country skiers and distance runners. They typically display 70 to 80 milliliters per kilogram per minute, which is no surprise because this is essentially everything that they train for. The problem with comparative studies like this, however, is that distance runners and even cross-country skiers probably are much better at running than wrestlers, and if your running form sucks, then you will waste more energy and you will get tired quicker, so this might give misleading data. But since wrestling is such an upper body dominant sport as well, we should also measure the endurance in the upper body, which the treadmill does a poor job of doing, so... In this study they measured the through the arm crank machine and they found out that the wrestlers can produce between 40.6 to 41 milliliters per kilogram per minute. Keep in mind though that this is a relatively high amount when you compare it to the values of the treadmill. This is a whole different area of the body so you can't compare a high value from the treadmill with the upper body. So yes, take the sport specificity in testing into consideration when reading studies like this. And also you need to know the fact that some athletes are more predisposed to endurance while others are more predisposed to power or strength qualities. And then we have to take into consideration the weight class and the gender of the wrestlers performing those endurance tests. Which is why I always recommend you to visit the sources that I provide so that you can see them in context. The numbers that I provided here are just generalizations of all weight classes combined, so you need to see them dissected as well. And generally speaking, the different energy systems, they work in a pyramid-like manner, meaning that the development of the one previous affects the one that succeeds it, at least when talking about the recovery. So if you have a strong aerobic system, you will basically recover quicker from high bursts and high intensity scenarios. You're, it aids your anaerobic systems in this way. And there are many reasons for this, but one main reason is that aerobic capacity increases the number of mitochondria, and the more mitochondria you have, the faster the lactate is cleared, allowing you to recover faster, of course. And then we have the regeneration of phosphocreatine. This fuels max effort scenarios, and this is reliant on creatine stores. This is why athletes take creatine as supplements. So even though we are training aerobic capacity, there is no reason for you to train like a marathon runner. You do not need to run for 3 hours or run for 50 kilometers. This pace is too far away from the demands of wrestling. We will go into this a bit later. But since aerobic endurance is relatively low to medium effort, it is most appropriately emphasized far away from competition in the preseason and occasionally in the in-season if you use it as a recovery session. Simply put, we want to stay within this region, the activity to rest ratio of 3 to 1 and all the way up to 1 to 2. Now let's discuss anaerobic endurance and arguably this is more important than the aerobic endurance and we will soon understand potentially why. First of all, it is not dependent on oxygen because this is predominantly active when the intensity gets too high for the aerobic system to be predominant, which is almost the entire wrestling match basically. Peak and mean anaerobic power is usually measured with a Wingate test, which is basically max out efforts on this bicycle machine. And the byproduct of this system is lactate, which additionally releases those hydrogen ions into the bloodstream, and this explains this sour and awkward feeling you get from going all out in something. And when we analyze lactate elevations from wrestling matches, it varies between 15 up to 20 millimoles per liter, and this is a very significant level that is often unmatched in many other sports. In fact, most people will never even experience 15 during a lifetime, let alone 20. In normal resting scenarios, it is between 1 to 2, just to give you a comparison. This data that we are about to go through now is based on a meta-analysis which went through 150 research papers done on wrestlers. And here they characterize anaerobic endurance as strength endurance, but yeah. They found out that elite male wrestlers through various weight classes can perform 54 to 70 push-ups, 52 to 77 sit-ups, and 15 to 50 pull-ups per minute. Regarding the pull-ups for example, I don't care if it's partial repetitions or if it is kipping pull-ups, the strictness of them. 50 pull-ups? Anywhere, like, this is an extremely impressive number. And this might be regarded as common sense, but they also found out that there is a relationship between the success of the wrestler and 
the strength endurance that they can display, meaning that successful wrestlers were superior in this department, which is probably obvious why. And you can read the meta analysis yourself, we're not talking about one wrestler, a lot of them were close to this number. This is very impressive. And here are the mean power and the peak power results standardized for body weight from various wrestlers of various levels and weight classes. If you ever do a Wingate test, you can perhaps compare your results to this. Nevertheless, it's not like super important for you to know all of those terms, it's just a curious fact. And here are the various adaptations that occur from anaerobic training. You can pause this picture if you want. And this obviously begs the question, what determines the shift from aerobic to anaerobic? When do we know when the aerobic system has had enough and the anaerobic system kicks in? Well, this is different for everyone. This is known as the lactate threshold, and as you can see in the graph here, when the line becomes steep, this is when we know the body shifts over to anaerobic endurance. And the higher the fitness of the athlete, the more prolonged this shift will be, the lactate threshold in other words. And this is obviously a very sought after trait, and is one of the pieces of the puzzle of endurance development. And anaerobic endurance is so important, why? Because wrestling matches are very intense and volatile and unpredictable. And often this pace will be so high that the oxygen will simply not reach the muscles in time, regardless of whether you can run a marathon, do a triathlon or swim for 6 hours straight. The pace is not similar to wrestling in those conditions, we need high intensity endurance. And to train high intensity endurance, to train the anaerobic system, anaerobic endurance, the efforts that you experience in those intervals must be submaximal to maximal for extended amounts of time. And you must rest adequately between those bursts so that you can repeat them in a relatively non-fatigued state. In essence, I recommend that you focus on high effort, quality that is, before quantity during the intervals, otherwise you will merely be, quote, exercising. Those intervals are supposed to be tough. And anaerobic endurance is most appropriately emphasized during the pre-season and in the early in-season. We will go into this more. Basically, you want to stay within this region, an activity to rest ratio of 1 to 3 to 1 to 5. So what are the formats for endurance training? We can talk about this for days on end, but let's focus on the key ones. And those are steady state training, aerobic intervals, and high intensity intervals. They all have their pros and cons, and they are all appropriate for the right context. Let's go through them one by one. Let's begin with steady state training. This is probably the first thing that comes to mind when we even think of endurance, and it is the go-to of many recreational athletes. But sadly it is not regarded as a sport specific method that is in line with the efforts experienced in wrestling. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it, because once again in the off season we want to build an aerobic tank, so if you insist, I would recommend you keep the duration between 20 to 30 minutes, focus on quality before quantity. You probably shouldn't do it for 3 hours straight, because once again, it's gonna deviate too far from the demands of wrestling, so focus on increasing your efforts within those 20 to 30 minutes instead. Doing 30 minutes all out effort is sometimes much harder than just doing 60 minutes medium effort. And again, this is most appropriately done in the off season, far away from competitions. And the training method when it comes to steady state, it doesn't really matter that much. I would just recommend choosing a format that you are enthusiastic about, whether that is the assault bike, running, or even circuit training. Now let's go for our second method for aerobic training, and that is aerobic intervals, arguably more favorable than steady state cardio. And that is for the reason that they will be performed in a periodic fashion with appropriate rest periods so that you can exert more effort between rounds. And for that reason the intensity will be higher than that of steady state training, but lower than that of high intensity intervals, which we will discuss soon. So this is obviously more sport specific to the demands of wrestling. And although the priority here remains aerobic, anaerobic conditioning will be partially emphasized as well. And this is another added benefit, because that cannot be achieved with steady state training to the same extent. Normally in aerobic intervals, they will last between 2 to 8 minutes per round with rest periods of 30 to 120 seconds. And you might begin on the higher end and then cut down to the lower end in the coming weeks. And then when you reach the pre-season, we will go over to high intensity intervals, which we will discuss very soon. And this is obviously most appropriate during the off-season, far away from competition, 
you might substitute this with steady state endurance training altogether or you might begin with steady state and then go over to the aerobic intervals throughout the off season. Here are some various exercises and formats you can use for the purpose of aerobic intervals. This is definitely not written in stone, the only purpose here is to give you concrete scenarios that you can try to get inspiration from for your own sessions. There is many entry points to this. Now let's go through the gold standard for endurance training for the sport of wrestling or any combat sport for that matter and that is high intensity intervals. This is periods of a very high intensity efforts for short periods of times followed by longer rest periods. It is not only useful for the anaerobic system but also the aerobic system. It is two birds in one stone. Intervals of 10 to 120 seconds are common depending on your goal with rest periods of 1 to 3 minutes. High intensity interval training is most appropriately done in the pre-season or in the in-season if used moderately. You might do it in the off-season as well if you are very conservative because in the off-season you generally do a lot of strength and power training in addition and since high intensity interval training is so neurologically demanding it might come in the way of your strength and power emphasis so use it conservatively. Generally speaking, high intensity intervals is divided into three formats. Short high intensity intervals, medium heat and long heat. And obviously it is the duration of the rounds that differ. So my recommendation for you is that you begin in the first cycle of the preseason with long heat and then you shift over to medium and end with short heat. Short heats will be very, very demanding on a neurological level because you have to put your absolute fullest effort into those 10 to 20 to 30 seconds, whatever it is that you do, so that you train your brain to recruit motor units and produce some sort of a power endurance. So in essence, the effort you put forth in a 120 second round is astronomically different from the effort in a 20 second round. The shorter the round is, the more it accounts for effort that you put forth. Use that as a rule of thumb. Now we have gone through the energy systems, the training formats, the time and activity to rest ratios and all of that. Let's go through some methods for endurance training. Should we use machines? Should we run? Should we use circuit training? That's what we're gonna answer now. Generally for the sport of wrestling, those are some common methods that are used. We have conditioning machines, running and sprinting, prowlers and sleds, circuit training, and of course, wrestling specific drills. They all have their pros and cons and they are all appropriate in the right context. There is no right or wrongs, it depends on the context, like most other things in sports science. Conditioning machines such as rowing ergometers, air bikes, skiing ergometers, they are very valuable for their simplicity, accessibility and the ability to track metrics. You have an LCD monitor that tells you the wattage you burn, the RPM, the distance covered and you can effectively track those and set goals for yourself and create a game-like quality to your training. This is very hard to do when you do other methods such as circuit training. The biggest con with those methods however is their limited movement pattern which is often locked into a single and monotonous position. So this is a very valuable training method if you approach it in a smart manner and of course in conjunction with other sport specific methods periodically. And there are many conditioning machines that you can use, some of them are more sport specific, others are not, but sometimes it's not only about sport specificity, there is other benefits as well. You may go through this list if you want. Now of course running and sprinting is not the most sport specific method, but there is always hidden benefits even in methods like this. First of all, it is very accessible and straightforward, it can be done anywhere on the planet, almost. The major con is that it exclusively isolates the lower body and the core. The upper body is neglected because you need pushing and pulling motions as well in wrestling and those are very heavily emphasized. And it requires proficient running technique. And this is generally regarded as a high impact training method. So in addition to heavy strength training and power training and tough wrestling sessions, it might be too much at times. Sometimes the best training method is not the most sport specific or the one that resembles the sport the most. Sometimes the best training method is the one that the athlete will actually do with happiness and enthusiasm because then they will put forth more effort and they will develop better mentally and physically from this. This is a very under-discussed topic. Another major benefit with running and sprinting which is hard to emulate with many other training methods is the outdoors. 
We might pride ourselves of all of the scientific breakthroughs and achievements of modern age, but fundamentally we are still the same as the hunter-gatherers and cavemen we were tens to thousands to hundreds and thousands of years ago. We need the sunlight, we need the wind in our face, we need lakes, forests and mountains. This affects our enthusiasm, our mood, and if we feel good, we put forth better effort, obviously. And here are some common use formats for this purpose. Now a close cousin to sprinting is prowler or sled training, because it is essentially like sprinting, but a weighted variation which has some added benefits, because this becomes a total body training method. Because not only are you running with your lower body, but you're also pushing with your upper body in a somewhat similar stance to wrestling, which makes it very, very sport specific. This can be used for both endurance and strength development, depending on the activity to rest ratio and the weights that you load it with. And here is the thing, most prowlers they will have both a high bar and a low bar so you can vary them in the workout or in separate workouts. You can also alternate between prowler drags, that is you drag the prowler or you push the prowler. And here are some ideas of how you may structure up a prowler or sled training session. And then we have circuit training, and the advantages of this is obvious. You can target different movements, different muscle groups, you're not locked into a single movement pattern. You can vary everything, and it can be done in either long aerobic intervals or high intensity intervals. There are many possible combinations and scenarios that you may use with circuit training. There is no limit to how many exercises you can include, whatever you wish. But you have to remember that circuit training is not strength training. Strength training needs to be in a non-fatigue state and you need progressive overload with heavier weights. You cannot expect to develop similar strength levels with circuit training. Circuit training is mostly an endurance training format. Nevertheless, a good idea is to target all fundamental movement patterns, which you can see on this list here. Now, they might be too much for one session exclusively, so you have different alternatives. Either vary them from session to session, or include multiple circuits within the session that you are doing and target all of them. Whatever is convenient for you. And the good idea about circuit training is all of the different entry points and the tools that you can use. There is no rights and wrongs, it is contextual. There is a list of different tools that you may use for your circuit training. As long as you involve the fundamental movement patterns, you may use any tool that is convenient for your circumstances. And this begs the question, how do we progress in difficulty when we implement circuit training? Because unlike rowing machines for instance, we don't have an LCD monitor telling us the wattage and if we wish to implement this it might be very costly. So the simple answer to that is go by intuition and Increase the rounds, that is one alternative that you can do. You may even tweak the rest periods and the activity periods slightly. And you might even slightly tweak the intensity of the exercises within the circuit. For example, if you did 12 kilogram kettlebells one session, okay, try tweaking them slightly, up to 14 kilograms for instance. But don't over exaggerate, we're not doing strength training here, we're doing endurance. If you're not using a time limit on the station, you're doing repetition based limits on each station, just increase the repetition range. But the best way to progress is arguably to put forth more effort. For instance, if it is 30 seconds in one station, one round, it might not always be the time format or even the intensity of the uh, tools that are the issue, it might be your effort. Here's an example of a full comprehensive circuit training session. Once again, it's not written in stones, you don't have to do exactly like this, it's just a hypothetical example to give you some inspiration. And our last component here is wrestling specific training, which is an excellent alternative for psychological preparation before a match. So you can use this method to isolate weak links. For example, let's say you cannot defend single leg takedowns appropriately, then you train with a partner that enters in a single leg takedown and you begin from there and you go at high intensity rounds. You begin in a disadvantage position and work. There is millions of approaches to this. Another typical method is the popular shark tank conditioning or the man in the middle, where you stand in the middle and you partners take turns on you and you have to defend yourself. Or you can do combined conditioning drills with wrestling, for example all out on the assault bike and then immediately go and wrestle with a partner. The con with this training method is that it is obviously very psychologically and physically demanding and it cannot be done too often, it might be too overwhelming. Here is a list of training methods that falls under this category. And then of course we have the metrics, the data. 
a system to measure our effort, a system to set new goals and track our progress, which is a vital point in even endurance. There are three key ways to do this. Number one is heart rate, and then we have Bohr's RPE scale and power production. Let's begin by going through heart rate. This is an objective measure. If you do an assault bike round of 5 minutes and heart rate of 180, it's 180, regardless of how you felt about it. There are advanced methods to find out your heart rate in an accurate manner, but a simplified method is to take 220 minus your age. Now with our heart rate in mind, we can divide the effort into different intensity zones, with 5 being the toughest and 1 being of moderate or low intensity. And it also gives us certain hints to what energy system is predominant. Knowing that in zone 5, close to 90-100% to of our heart rate, it probably becomes anaerobic because the intensity and effort gets too high for the aerobic system to be predominant. This table right here is severely generalized, it does not apply equally to everyone. Heart rate is good because it puts the exercise into context. For example, let's say you perform the assault bike on 5 minutes per round and before, this would cost 80% of your maximal heart rate. But now the average is 75% of your maximal heart rate, let's say one week later. This hints that your fitness has increased obviously, you're now more fit and efficient. Now primarily heart rate is mostly relevant to aerobic exercise because when you get to anaerobic conditions, it's gonna be maximal intensity and max heart rate by default because it's so tough. For this sole reason, it also gives us hints when we have reached the anaerobic threshold. So when you reach the maximal levels of your heart rate, then you can know on a general basis that you have reached the anaerobic threshold as well. And then we have Boris RPE scale, which is a subjective scale of 6 to 20 that you may then evaluate each of your efforts with. And each of those scores will give us hint of what energy system is predominant during the effort, so to speak, on each round of whatever training method that we are using. So one of the single greatest things you can do in your endurance is to combine RPE with heart rate, and this will give you a very accurate assessment. For example, if on one day your average heart rate was 155 during the round and you give that RP 13 and on another day the average was 165 and you give that RP 15, this hints at an accurate evaluation of course, so you can compare those metrics together. And then the last metric we're gonna talk about is power production. Sadly this is only exclusive to stationary machines because they have a locked pattern so it becomes easy to measure. In a live wrestling scenario it becomes very hard to measure power production and it would likely require very advanced and expensive equipment. So let's say you have a training intervention where you will perform 8 sets of 1 minute intervals on a weekly basis on high intensity. In the first week your mean and peak power were 300 and 400 watts respectively. In the second week it went up to 330 and 430, so an increase obviously. You will now know that you exerted yourself more in the latter week, because this is an objective measure. Just like if you were to perform strength training and you lift 100kg one session and 110kg another session, it hints that you have probably become stronger. So this is also a measure but for endurance scenarios. And couple this with other metrics such as RPE and even your heart rate and you have some valuable information that gives you the biggest possible picture. The more metrics and more data you have at your disposal, the more accurate the outline of every session and your development becomes. And you cannot cheat yourself with wattage. If for instance one day your 300 watts were RP14 while on another day it was RP18, it is safe to say that you were not feeling as fit or ready that day. And some adjustments may be needed. This is the value of combining it with other metrics. Now let's talk about periodization. For most people when they see this word they become terrified. But you don't need to be terrified, it's actually very simple. So we have at our disposal all of those different components that we need to emphasize. Everything we have gone through in this video, all of the options. Periodization basically takes all of those and divides them into manageable tasks, into blocks in a periodic fashion. That's it. It's basically planning. You take the grand objective and you divide it into manageable tasks. But what might not be as simple is to actually define the grand objective. What is the grand objective? There is no simple answer for this, you need to assess your situation. It's different for every individual. 
take a notepad and a pencil and go through some vital questions for yourself so that you can have an outline of your objective to begin with before you even start periodization. How are you supposed to plan if you don't have the parameters at hand? With that being said, here is an example schedule of a competitive wrestler. Let's say they do two strength and power sessions per week and we have six wrestling sessions and two endurance sessions. Again, this is just an hypothetical example. You might do more sessions or less than that. So considering that you have an off season up to four months, which again varies between different wrestling cultures, you might do the first half steady state aerobic training and the other half aerobic intervals. And additionally, because we do aerobic emphasis during this period, you can afford to do a lot of strength and power training, which will be the topic of another video. I have actually made a lot of videos on this in the past. You can check them out if you want. And then the preseason, which may last up to three months, you start going into high intensity interval training. Begin with low, medium, and then go into short. And then in the in season, which might last for up to half a year, you want to maintain all of those qualities. You will have a lot of tough wrestling practices here, you will cut weight, you will have a lot of matches, so it's really hard to know how many additional high intensity interval sessions you can do on top of that, how much strength and power you can do on top of that. I'm not saying you should disregard it completely, I'm just saying cut down on the frequency because you want to maintain them now. Thank you for watching this video. If you're interested in additional resources, just visit my website. I have some programs available and you have private coaching by me as well. And if you want to stick to the free videos, that is perfectly fine also. I will never deliberately withhold any information.